Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program, What Ails the Working Class in America. Please welcome Chris DeMuth, Distinguished Fellow in American Thought in the Simon Center for American Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, near and far, welcome to the Heritage Foundation and to this conference on what ails the working class in America. As long as I've been in Washington, which is a very long time, the political class of politicians and executives and think tankers and journalists have been decrying the fact that in America, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, the middle class is getting hollowed out. I've always been skeptical of these uh, claims. Uh, the data on income and wealth is complicated and in many respects uh, conflicting. Um, and it is in the interest of the Washington political class to identify, <clears throat> identify problems out there uh, that Washington uh, can claim uh, to be solving with a new program. And for over 100 years in America, outright income distribution has been a powerful force in politics. But in the last years, in the last uh, decade or two, uh, this has changed with regard to the circumstances of America's working class and lower middle class. <clears throat> and by that, I mean simply uh, people who generally work standing on their feet, working with their hands in the actual physical world of things and providing services to real present people, as opposed to the much more highly compensated modern Americans who work uh, sitting at a computer in the booming virtual world of data and information. On the circumstances of the American working class, the data has none of the ambiguities of data on wealth and income. I'm referring to data on employment, morbidity and mortality, drug addiction, marriage and child rearing and family uh, stability, community involvement, and all of these uh, point, uh, uh, paint a consistent picture of real uh, distress and they are fortified by reporting and visits to deindustrialized, uh, clapped out uh, towns, uh, uh, mainly uh, but not entirely in the Middle West and in the South. At the same time, this political class I've referred to has pretty much lost interest in the working class, are actually turned against the deplorables who are resisting the progressive projects of globalization identity politics, and administrations of the administrative uh, state. The working class and the managerial elite is the new divide in American politics. Uh, but there are some people in Washington who are seriously, studiously concerned with the problems of the working class. And we have th four eminent uh, members uh, of this uh, group uh, with us uh, today uh, to illuminate, uh, to enlighten us on the nature and causes of these problems and what might be done about them. Uh, <clears throat> Oren Cass is the author of the wonderful book, The Once and Future Worker, A Vision for the Renewal of America. Uh, he is the founder and executive director of American Compass, a five-year-old uh, uh, highly uh, uh, admirable uh, new Washington activist uh, think tank, which declares, we are developing a conservative agenda to supplant blind faith in free markets with a focus on workers, their families and communities, and the national interest. Nick Eberstadt holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute. He is the author of Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis, and dozens of original, <coughs> um, rigorous, influential books and hundreds of articles on American and international demographics, politics, and social welfare. 
Ian Murray is Vice President for Strategy and a Senior Fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He is author of The Socialist Temptation and other best-selling books and a forthcoming, soon forthcoming, heritage paper on free markets and the common good. I believe that Ian's orientate would say that his orientation to free markets is not blind faith, but rather deeply considered, empirically grounded enthusiasm. Rick Santorum was United States Senator representing the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for two terms, 1995 to 2007, and was the third ranking Republican in the Senate uh, during his second term. Since then, he has uh, been highly active as a political commentator and a leader in a variety of social and policy causes and author of Blue Collar Conservatives, Recommitting to an America That Works. In this political season, let us recall that Senator Santorum ran for, ran for president in 2012. He won the Iowa caucus followed by 10 statewide victories in presidential primaries before he was before he succumbed to the Mitt Romney juggernaut powered as it was by Romney's brilliant policy advisor Oren Cass gentlemen will you please take the stage Oren the podium is yours All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Chris, thank you so much for, for organizing this. It's um, fantastic to have you here at Heritage. And I think Heritage is doing such an important job convening these discussions right now, which are so central to to where we have to be going as conservatives. Um, it is especially an honor to, to be up on the stage with the senator. Um, if, you, if you speak to any of my colleagues from the 2012 Romney campaign, they'll tell you I was sitting there in my office saying, what's this Santorum guy saying in Iowa? I don't know. I think I, that actually makes some sense. And I, in fact, won $10 betting that he would win the Iowa caucus. <laughs> so very, very proud of that. If not, some of the, the directions our party has maybe gone in, in the interim. Um, what ails the working class in America? I think this is obviously an incredibly important question. It's the sort of question that one might ponderously start by saying, well, who are we to answer that question? We need a panel full of working class Americans to answer that question, or else perhaps we need somehow to put ourselves in the shoes of working class Americans. Um, my view is actually the opposite. I think we've spent far too much time putting our shoe ourselves in other people's shoes, expecting they must somehow think differently than we do. And in fact, the best way to answer this question is to put ourselves back in our own shoes and, and ask what matters to us. What matters when we decide whether to work, what job we want to take? Who here has chosen their own work on the basis of the thing that will pay them the most marginal dollars per hour calculating the optimal number of hours to work before the tax rate gets too high or before they lose a benefit. That's not how we make our decisions. Who thinks about their own child and says, well, gosh, I sure hope he earns at least 1% more in hourly wage than I did, because as long as that's the case, we'll be doing just fine. I don't think anybody thinks that way or has that ambition for their child. No one evaluates their own success their family's success on how many televisions they have, whether their car has seat warmers. And I don't think we should expect that anybody else does either. It seems to me instead that we should recognize that in this broader debate we so often end up with, is it economics, is it culture? Obviously, it's both. What, what, what decision do we make that we say, well, that, that's just economics is why we're behaving the way we are. Well, that's culture. Think about people in your lives who have made bad decisions. You say like, well, that, that's just the culture. That's just, obviously, what motivates people's behavior is the combination and intersection of both. What options are available to people? What are the implications of choosing those different options? Yes, in terms of money, but just as much in terms of pride, dignity, respect. 
in terms of agency, autonomy, control, purpose, meaning, achievement, connection, community, solidarity, rootedness, stability, predictability. Those are all of the things that determine anybody's decisions. And those are all the things that the working class has seen fade away in recent decades, at least as much as they've seen wage stagnation, in fact, compound and amplify those challenges. And so what I wanted to do is just share a couple of slides that I think help to look at things through anybody's point of view instead of through the perspective of an economics textbook. One chart that many people are familiar with that we use a lot at American Compass is this one, what we call the cost of thriving index. Economists get very angry when we use this chart because this is not good economics. As any real economist knows, all you have to do is take your hourly wage, deflate it by not the consumer price index, that's the wrong deflator. There's a different, better deflator that will tell you the exact value of your money. And according to that, actually somebody in 2020 earns a little bit more than somebody did in 1970. And so by definition, it must be earlier, easier to make ends meet. Now, obviously, none of us would evaluate our own well-being or ability to make ends meet by that standard. And so I would suggest we not apply that to the rest of the country. How do we think about how we're doing economically? How do I think about it? I'm incredibly blessed to be very comfortable financially. But this is still what I think about. What do I actually pay for housing every year, to live in a good neighborhood, in a community where I want to be? What do I pay to buy the kinds of cars that are actually available in the market today? What do I pay for health care? And gosh, if I lost my job, what would I have to pay for health care? And no, I don't think about that by going on the Obamacare exchange and figuring out exactly what my subsidy would be. I think about what health insurance costs. How do I think about what food costs? Well, I actually look at how much it costs to buy the food that a typical family eats. And if you stack up those bars, what are my kids going to do when they get older? How are they going to afford college if they want to go? Yes, I know there's a lot of financial aid available, but gosh, I'd sure like to be able to help them afford that cost myself. If I stack up those costs, your typical middle class family in the 1980s, a father earning a typical wage, could actually cover all of that with significant leftover to spare. It takes 35 weeks, 40 weeks of income in a prior generation to cover that. Now it would take more than 60 weeks. That's a problem in a 52-week year. And yes, we have all sorts of ways to compensate for that. We have all the government programs that make it easier. We have the worst car that maybe you could buy. We have all of the subsidies for health insurance. But once upon a time, we didn't need those things. And if you want to know why it has become harder to make ends meet in the working class, that, not the inflation index, is what you need to look at. Second chart, economists hate this one too. This is just straight up math. You can calculate yourself this yourself using the straightforward government data provided on the Bureau of Economic Analysis website. Here's growth in corporate profits per, and I do it per capita, let's take into account the growth in the population of the US in recent decades. Here is growth in GDP per capita looking good. Here's growth in labor productivity. Here's growth in the average wage of a production and non-supervisory worker. Now, there are lots of things you can do to explain this away. You can say, well, I want to use a different inflation index. It brings the bars closer together. It certainly doesn't eliminate the gap. You could say, well, don't forget the other things. Don't forget all of the health care benefits. Don't forget all the other things people now get besides their wage. Also true. But if you're somebody working, being paid by the hour, I'm not sure how much good it does for you that also health care benefits are now really expensive and somebody's providing them. Not sure the health of the working class has actually got a lot better. And so what you actually see and what I think people feel as a result of these economic trends is that there's been an extraordinarily, extraordinary amount of economic progress in this country for some people, but not for everybody, and in fact, not for most people. And when you look at that 1% average wage, you say, well, it's not any lower. I was, I was doing a conversation with someone recently. They said, well, you know, the real problem is that people in the working class, you know, they feel like they should be able to go and like buy the newest truck. And I see them driving around in a big truck, and I don't know if they need that truck. 
that's probably true. They probably don't need that truck. But what's the converse here? The converse is to tell the working class and the rest of America the story that, no, you actually don't get to share in the rising prosperity. All those things we said about how a rising tide was going to lift all boats actually wasn't true. We all get big new trucks, but you don't. But since you have as good a truck as you used to, please stop complaining. I don't think that's going to work politically. I also don't think it's right substantively as a description of well-being. Next slide. And so one thing I wish we would do a lot more of in the conservative movement and that we've tried to start doing in American Compass is actually just asking people what they actually think and taking the results at face value. Is rising inequality a big problem? I apologize, I guess the font is probably too small here. Take a look on our website. We have the exact wording of the questions for those who are deeply concerned about such things. I think they're quite well-worded questions because we actually wanted to know the answer. And yes, those blue bars are people who say rising inequality is a big problem. It's lower for Republicans, though notably actually big problems still bigger than not a big problem. But certainly if you look across classes, most people would say rising inequality is a big problem. The fact that your absolute living standard may still be as good as it was, that's better than a declining living standard, but it's not good enough. And I think it's important to keep in mind, think this through for yourself again. Why isn't it good enough? It's not because you're laden with grievance. It's not because you're jealous about somebody else. It's because a lot of the things that matter in this world come down to the allocation of scarce resources. You may have seen that the chart, I think it's a very good chart showing how incredibly prices have come down for basically anything you can manufacture and how prices have skyrocketed for all the, you know, healthcare, education, et cetera. One part of that story is surely the higher government subsidization of that latter category. But there's also a reason that that's why there's so much public policy. And it's because those are the areas where we have scarce resources to allocate. Right? We can just improve technology and make more TVs for everybody. But how many good teachers are there in the country? And which districts are those teachers going to teach in when some people have huge school budgets and other people have much lower school budgets? How many great doctors are there in the country? And which hospitals are those doctors going to be working in? If you, again, think about the things that matter in your own life and then ask, OK, what if you were always on the bottom? You'd care an awful lot even if your inflation-adjusted income looked similar to how it did in prior decades. Are stagnating wages a big problem? Popular argument we hear from the right sometimes is, well, technically, if you're earning the same wage somebody earned 50 years ago, well, you should be just as marriageable. After all, you have as much money as someone did in the late 1960s. This is obviously not true. And when you ask people, everybody, including Republicans, they will say that's obviously not true. Stagnating wages are a big problem. And is economic pressure to have two working parents a big problem? One way you solve that cost of thriving index problem is to have two parents working. Then the income line is bigger than the cost line. But guess what? In the past, you didn't have to do that. You could do that, but you didn't have to. And so to describe it as a choice, what has instead become a necessity, is to deprive people of exactly the sorts of agency, autonomy, and control that they used to have and reply upon, and which we have all value far more than we value the, the number of gadgets that we can afford. I want to just briefly segue to starting to think about, well, what would this mean for policy? We try to start asking people questions about actual trade-offs. So one thing that comes through loud and clear is the importance of place. The left side of this chart asks people which would they prefer for their kid, education that leads to a good career close to home or that leads to the best career far from home. Down at the bottom is the upper class, big blue bar, best career far from home. Everybody else, big red bar, good career close to home. And then on the right side, well, which would you prefer, a focus on helping people move to opportunity or a focus on helping struggling places recover. Everybody, more than two to one, helping struggling places recover. And I don't know how statistically significant it is, but highest value working class, about 10 points stronger emphasis on helping struggling places recover than what you see in the upper class. 
So this is my extremely abstract chart that I will summarize with. When we are having these discussions, material living standards are absolutely important. I'm not suggesting we all go live in cabins in the woods. But let's think in our own lives what share of the pie chart material living standard is in assessing how our lives are going. And then let's be sure to remember that everybody else has that kind of pie chart too. Thank you very much. It's always good to be back with my friends at Heritage. Uh, my first desk in Washington 40 years ago was at Heritage, three buildings down, I think on the fifth floor. And of course, it's always a pleasure to be with my uh, longtime boss, uh, Chris DeMuth, who's my boss at AEI for, uh, we don't want to say how many years, do we, Chris? <laughs> um, if we're going to talk about what ails the working class, I think we have to uh, talk more broadly about what uh, ails the United States of America. And Oren was just pointing some blind spots, I think, in the, uh, that often afflict the uh, uh, describers and the deciders uh, looking at problems for America. One, um, uh, one thing which we have to begin by saying is that there is a, um, there is a misery afoot in the United States that is howling if you are willing to listen to it or listen for it. And it in, its features include family breakdown, the flight from faith, rampaging crime, dependency on government, dependency on drugs, deaths of despair, alienation, and epidemic loneliness. Um, these are uh, aspects of degradation that we don't always qualify, uh, quantify, uh, but are always qualitatively important in our country. Uh, I'm going to look at one little part of that great big, uh, perhaps dispiriting tableau, to the question about work in America and uh, what ails the working class. And I, again, I think that what ails the working class in this respect is kind of like what ails uh, the country, which is that there are an awful lot of people who aren't working. Um, I've, I've got a slide deck here, which I'm going to uh, leave, share with uh, the audience and with the online audience. I think it'll be available after the discussion. Um, so I'm not going to you know, subject you to total uh, death by PowerPoint. But I do want to uh, bring a few uh, general facts to your attention to help, uh, help think about this uh, new misery that we all face. And the first is the uh, collapse of work for men, and I emphasize men. Um, from the 1960s to the present, there has been a relentless increase in the proportion of prime age guys, the 25 to 54 year olds who at one time were the backbone of the labor force and were also kind of uh, more than incidental in the uh, formation of families and the raising of children. The steady uh, and astonishing rise in the proportion of men in this group who uh, have no paid work uh, since, the, uh, since the beginning of the 21st century, if you average it out, the proportion of these guys uh, on a month-by-month -month basis with no uh, paid work is actually higher than it was the first time that this was measured in 1940 in the 40 census. Uh, that was the tail end of the Great Depression when the U.S. Uh, had an unemployment rate of almost 15 percent. So it's not... Uh, hyperbolic to say that American men in the prime of life are now facing sort of uh, tail end Great Depression problems with, uh, with employment. Um, and they're not facing these problems because jobs don't exist. Uh, if you take a look at 
the information in this chart here, um, you'll, you'll see that we are in the midst of that most unusual thing in the labor market, a peacetime job shortage, uh, a COVID-era peacetime job shortage. Um, employers are still practically begging for job applicants. And they're not just looking for hedge fund managers or chemical engineers. Um, millions and millions of jobs are uh, going uh, unattended. Job openings are going unattended uh, that require the main skills of uh, showing up regularly, not stoned. Um, the recovery from the Obama era a job slump um, has been very uneven. The recovery has been dramatic for prime age women, as you can see here, that's the red line. Uh, for, um, for prime age guys, not so much. We have to wonder why. Um, it doesn't look like that's kind of a macroeconomic thing to me. Um, and here's the latest uh, wrinkle in the flight from work in the United States. Uh, from the mid-90s until uh, the eve of the COVID pandemic, the one really uh, bright spot or ray of sunshine in the uh, labor market tableau was the rise of work uh, by old folks, by people 55 and older. Uh, increase in labor market participation, increase in work rates. Since uh, the COVID pandemic, you know, we're in the sort of the help, I've fallen down and can't get up portion of the program here with respect to labor force participation for us old folks. Um, why is this happening? It's not happening because we don't have uh, vaccines for COVID. It's not happening because we don't have uh, millions and millions of jobs uh, open and available. Um, there's one other aspect to this overall tableau that I wanted to bring to your attention. And this is the bookend to the men without work. This is a new phenomenon which I don't know if we call it women without work, but uh, the group on this chart that's growing exponentially that I'm describing are prime age women between the ages of 25 uh, and 54 uh, who are neither working nor looking for work nor in education or training, nor have children at home nor are currently married. Uh, the men without work I was describing, the guys prime age neither working nor looking for work, about a cohort of seven million. So far, this group of women is about three million, but stay tuned. Um, it's important to ask what, um, what people who are labor force dropouts do all day long from the time they wake up until the time they go to sleep. And we have some, we have some information on this uh, from government surveys, uh, with the caveat that everybody is a liar. It's sometimes interesting to look at what they say. Um, I've, put, I've put one of these um, assemblies of uh, self-reported time use uh, on the chart for your uh, review. There are a couple of things in there that I think are worth taking a look at. Um, one of them in particular is um, what men, women, and older guys, prime age men and women and older guys who are neither working nor looking for work do with their time with respect to entertainment and leisure. And we find that for a prime age men, one of the main activities in uh, life is watching. We don't know from these reports what they're watching, uh, but uh, prime age guys spend almost uh, 2,000 hours a year watching screens. Uh, in, a, in a different category, that would be a pretty good, uh, pretty fair full-time job. Uh, prime age women are not quite there yet, but stay tuned. What we can see is that the prime age female dropouts 
uh, report that they are, that almost half of them report that they are taking pain medication every day, uh, which is a pretty unsettling catch up uh, with the male dropouts. Um, it's hard, I'll skip over this one. Um, two other points I'll make if I have the time. Um, high school dropout guys are the least likely to be attached to the labor force, but it is not a homogeneous pool. There are a lot of difference. There are a lot of life stories in that pool. If you take a look at uh, high school dropout guys who are married, they're always more likely to be uh, attached to the labor force. If you take a look at uh, prime age high school guys who came from other countries, their attachment to the labor force is indistinguishable from college grads in America. Um, this one, this last one, um, Oren was talking about attachment and place. There are some mysteries which I don't think have yet been solved in, uh, by uh, social scientists uh, with respect to uh, divergence across the country in uh, workforce attachment and work. What I've got up here on this map is the, um, the uh, counties which have the highest workforce attachment. Those are in blue. And the ones that have the lowest, those are in red. Um, there are some interesting stories here that need to be examined. Uh, we need to learn more about it. It would even be wonderful if we had some answers, but we have to ask the questions that would allow us to have the answers for this. Thank you very much. The topic of this panel is something that has concerned me since my earliest days as a rational adult. I grew up in the industrial northeast of England, in the aspirational working class family at a time of significant change and upheaval. My grandfather was a coal miner who wanted his son to escape the pit. And so my father had left school at 14 to train as an electrician and eventually became an electrical engineer who built power stations all over the world. Yet even as my parents strove to send me to private school, not an easy thing in 1970s Britain, I should add, the industries of my hometown were in collapse. Coal mining and shipbuilding, which had been protected from competition through nationalization for so many years, were no longer sustainable. When Margaret Thatcher took the unpopular decision to privatize these industries, it was a death knell for them. And it seemed like it was a death knell for my hometown. Prime age male unemployment in that town, South Shields, hit 50% in the mid 1980s. Thatcher became a dirty word there and to some extent it still is. But even as those old industries died, hope emerged. Nissan opened a new plant, attracted by the skilled workforce and the low regulation of an enterprise zone. Slowly but surely, other industries emerged to fill the gaps left by the old ones. Call centers may not be everyone's idea of fulfilling work, but they provide higher wages than the jobs they replaced and they are far less dangerous. Coal mining may be noble work, but I will never forget how my strong grandfather withered away before my eyes as black lung disease claimed him. Today, my hometown's unemployment rate remains above the national average, but not significantly so. It's a happy and vibrant place, at least as long as the local football team is winning, Henry. <laughs> The area even saw the Conservatives challenging for the first time in over 100 years at the last general election. 
an achievement Rishi Shunak seems all too happy to throw away. So the question I have for everyone today is, why is that process of adaptation I saw in my homeland not happening in my adopted land? Why do we seem to have only half of what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction, the destructive half? Moreover, why does that destruction seem so much more destructive? Not just why aren't people in the labor force, which Nick has sulfurly explored, but why do they so often feel that they are stuck in dead end jobs? working for someone who seems at odds with their values, with no hope of advancement, or feel that the jobs that are available just don't offer opportunity. To explore this issue properly, I think we need to have to look at what has been, for some years, a crisis in what used to be a strength, American dynamism, and see how two Cs are compounding this problem, credentialism and corporatism. To begin with, we should review the trends in three core indicators of the strength of American dynamism. The rate of new firms being created, the rate at which people switch jobs, and the rate at which people move about the country. Let's start with new firm creation and old firms closing. This is really the heart of the creative part of creative destruction. If we look at the data, we can see that it really used to be the case that old firms closed down at a higher rate than they do today but even more firms opened up, and that this held through even through recessions. Then the financial crisis came and closures overtook openings. And after the, odd, the Great Recession wound down, an odd thing happened. Old firms stopped closing and new firms started opening at a much lower rate for both of them. COVID, of course, saw an uptick in both, but I'd be surprised to see the data change much as it updates going forward. What this implies is that there are fewer new jobs available and fewer people are forced to look for new work as a result of old firms closing. That doesn't mean firms aren't closing at all. 2023 saw an average of 3 million job losses per month, but it implies that a major source of career advancement has been curtailed somewhat. The corollary is that a greater proportion of the firms that do exist are older. And older firms generally mean that people get stuck in career structures and hit plateaus. Their salary or wage rises aren't as much as they would like, and they happen more slowly. The answer to this normally comes from job switching. Anyone who has been involved in real world employment, which is to say not at a think tank, knows that the best way to increase your salary is not to ask the boss for more, but to switch to a higher paying job. However, if there are fewer new firms and people aren't leaving jobs in firms that stick around longer, then that option isn't avail as available as it once was. So you stick in the same job and you feel like you're going nowhere. We see this trend in the rate of job reallocation data, which has settled at what seems to be a permanently lower rate since the financial crisis. Now, it used to be that Americans had an answer to this. If jobs weren't available in, this, in their hometown, some of them, not all, but some of them, would pack up and move to where there was work, even if it meant moving to another state. Yet interstate mobility has basically halved since the mid-2000s. And it seems that this isn't because Americans now love the place where they are more than they used to in the past. Roughly half of the people surveyed who feel that they're stuck in place would move to find better work if they felt they were able to do so. So what is going on? Why is America so much of worse of a place for dynamism than it used to be? Given that so much innovation happens as a result of dynamism, why are we squandering what has always been a uniquely American advantage? Why, perish the thought, are we becoming more like Europe? I'm a regulatory policy guy, first and foremost. So it may not surprise you to learn that my answer is the inexorable growth of regulation at the federal, state, and local levels. We're making it more and more difficult to do business in America, and that should terrify everyone. Let's start with federal regulation. Every year, my colleague Wayne Cruz charts the growth, because it's always growth, of federal regulation in a publication called 10,000 Commandments. Of course, we bust past the 10,000 regulations mark ages ago, 
So that's an understatement. But the growth just keeps on going. Many of these regulations are supposed to benefit the environment or ensure employment fairness or such like. But the end result is that they make it more difficult for businesses to form or to grow. It is a central rule of economics that incentives matter. And the vast majority of regulations disincentivize business formation and business growth. Take the self-employed owner-operator trucker, for instance. The COVID pandemic showed how vitally important these amazing men and women are to our economy. But the EPA wants them to ditch their traditional trucks for electric ones, which are much heavier and so allow much less room for shipping. While the lab labor regulators at the state and local levels say that if they have a contract with one firm, they should be an employee of that firm and not an independent businessman. It's not a good time to start a trucking business. Or look at fracking a business which was almost solely responsible for the job gains in America in the Obama era. Yet significant number of states, most notably New York, ban fracking entirely, killing opportunity in the industry. And just last week, the president said he wouldn't allow any more exports of liquefied natural gas on environmental grounds. The ramifications for the industry will be significant and good paying jobs will surely be lost. Yet even the most basic of businesses have to deal with regulatory costs. Wayne compiled this daunting looking slide of a table of regulations every business has to comply with on startup, on hiring their first employee, on hiring their third, and so on. All of this is paperwork costs. All of this paperwork costs keep the employer normally from concentrating on running and growing their business. And it's why you see concentrations of firms at employment levels just below the next step. You don't hire that next employee because of the costs of having to comply, not just for that employee, but for all your others. So regulations not only discourage new firm formation, they discourage the growth of firms. This obviously impacts the first two indicators of dynamism. The third, interstate migration is hit not just by those regulations, but by state level regulations on things like occupational licensing. If another state isn't going to recognize the license you worked so hard for, there's no way you're going to move state. And of course, the effects of disability and other welfare benefits have an effect that tie people to their state as well. And at the local level, zoning can kill the idea for a business stone dead by simply by making rental property just too ex expensive, among other effects. So deregulation, even modest deregulation, should have some effect in stopping the sclerosis we've seen. But I'm going to quickly talk about two other things that I think are having an effect as well. The first is credentialism. The high school diploma is no longer the ticket to a good job it used to be. Part of that is the dumbing down of the high school curriculum, but part of it actually traces to a civil rights case from 1970 called Griggs versus Duke Power that found that using assessment tests to check the skills and aptitude of workers could be racist. The effect of this was significant. Firms stopped using tests and started outsourcing the assessment of skills to universities. Where a high school diploma used to suffice, you needed a degree. This contributed to the exploding cost of college that is rapidly putting the degree, the ticket to a good job, out of reach of working class families. I'm not working class anymore, but I, don't, I know how much my children's tuition is and it is crippling. This has, of course, been accompanied by a sprint leftwards in university teaching. I talk about this more in my book, The Socialist Temptation, but it means the managerial class has become even more left-wing, thus divorced from the traditional values of the working class employees. This contributes to the problem of corporatism, where previously corporate managers would complain about regulation. Increasingly, they either embrace it or worse, lobby for it, thinking that by doing so, they will save the world. The ethos of global salvationism, as my late friend David Henderson put it, increases the appetite for corporate initiatives under the rubric of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or environmental, social, and governance, DEI and ESG. This has led to the creation of what Ross Green of Stand Together calls the acronym industrial complex. Corporations lobby for these regulatory frameworks as a means of fending off new competition and entrenching themselves as the only ones socially responsible enough to exist. Governments reinforce this through a process known as jawboning, which is simply put the threat of a regulator saying, nice business you have there, to be ashamed if it was subject to increased supervision. 
Companies either comply or face sanctions like Operation Chokepoint, which threatened to kill off small dollar lending, except from approved financial sources, before President Trump put an end to it. We're seeing Chokepoint reappear in new guises, by the way. So to return to my original point, the best solution to what ails the working class is a healthy dose of Thatcherism, in the sense of getting government out of the way and letting the genius of America's ultimate resource, its people, take over. Just look at the deregulatory proposals in Heritage Project 2025, which I was delighted to contribute to. There's a blueprint for a better tomorrow. As a movement, together, we can restore American dynamism, oath overthrow corporatism, and make America work again. Well, I, it's, uh, it's an honor to follow one grandson of a coal miner who had black lung with another grandson of a coal miner who had black lung, my, my grandfather. And um, it's, uh, you've, you've consumed a lot of meat here. Um, I am uh, the politician who's going to give you some empty calories to, uh, to top off your meal uh, and, uh, and discuss a little bit about just this, what ails the working class in America. Now, I came here, uh, probably the first time I came to Heritage was back in 1990, uh, you know, 30, 35 years ago, uh, 34 years ago. Uh, we'd have never seen that, uh, that, that, uh, that photo up here, uh, that topic up here. That was, that was just not something that conservatives ever really thought about because they weren't our voters. Uh, Republicans, I remember I got elected to the United States Senate in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, by losing the city of Philadelphia by a bunch, losing uh, Pittsburgh by a bunch, uh, losing the blue-collar areas of southwestern Pennsylvania, I mean, badly, labor-oriented, blue-collar areas of the Northeast and the Southeast. And I won the suburban communities, the wealthy suburban communities where, where the Republican rich suburbs were. Uh, all of those Republican rich suburbs today are voting 60 to 70 percent Democrat. Uh, and all those areas that I used to lose as were heavy blue collar, they were all voting 70 to 80 percent Republican. Uh, the Republican Party has changed, and uh, Orrin Cass and Mitt Romney didn't realize that back in, 19, in, in 2012. Uh, and the reality was that it has been changing over time. I wrote a, a book, um, first book I wrote was called It Takes a Family, and I talked about how the destruction of the American family and the culture changes that were going on in America were shifting the, the geopolitics of America. We were starting to see, because of, uh, of, of the, the elite cultural changes that were going on in America, that uh, and, and what was happening in our colleges and universities and our educational institutions, that they were, uh, they were changing the face of America. And they were changing the, 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 the realignment of the parties. Uh, I remember during that campaign in, in 2012, uh, uh, there was a, an event at the night of, uh, of, of the convention, which I spoke. And it was uh, focused on, you may remember Barack Obama said to small business people, you didn't build that, right? That, that the government had a role in helping to build your business. Uh, and so Romney dedicated an entire night of the convention trotting out small business person after small business person. I mean, different colors, different areas of the country. I mean, it was very, very diverse, but one small business person after another out there in the front. And I was the speaker later in the evening. So I got to meet all these people. And, I, and, and it just struck me that, I don't know if you know, but what percentage of America are small business owners? Like 5%, right? Not one of those people walked out there that night with a worker that worked with them. There wasn't a single worker on that stage that night. And, and, the, re and, I, and the reality is 74% of Americans, ages 25 to 65, don't have a college degree. So over 75 are workers, not owners. And by the way, they're now our voters. But we have not been a party, we have not been a movement that has really been talking to them or has tried to put our intellectual heft behind how we're gonna make life for those people better. And so one of the things I, I jumped at the opportunity when Chris called me to do this was just to say thank you. 
thank all of you for, uh, for the work that you're doing. Thank Heritage for caring enough about this because the conservative movement will die unless we feed the people who want to help us. You see, if we don't have policies and we don't have a vision and if we don't start doing things that address this issue of the middle of America that is now our voter, wants to be our voter, it's not completely our voter, and the biggest reason they're not completely our, our voter is not because of, uh, of, of the dynamic of, of, of the issues. It ha a lot of it has to do with people of color who fit that description are not our voters because of other impediments that have been that have developed over time where we haven't been able to get our message out to those voters, in part because we're sort of new at the party, in my opinion, in talking to working men and women of America. We have always been the party of cut taxes, cut government, everything else will be fine. Cut regulation, everything else will be fine. That doesn't necessarily appeal to people who are struggling out there, in, in, as, as has been described by the gentleman who talked before, of what's going on in America. It is, in many respects, the right answer. And by the way, I'm not saying that those aren't the right things to do, that cutting government and cutting taxes aren't the right thing. Uh, they are. Cutting regulation, cutting credentialism, all the things are talked about. But we have to do a better job at packaging that to the community that is our voter and wants to vote for us, and those who have not voted for us, but actually should, based upon the policy prescriptions that are going to benefit them in their lives. And so, to me, this is an opportunity at, that, that is before us now to come up with solutions and talk specifically about this and make it more of an emphasis. Understand who is buttering your bread. And if the, like I said, if the conservative movement doesn't grasp that and take it on. I, back in uh, 2014, I wrote the book that Chris referred to called Blue Collar Conservatives. And uh, I did it because uh, of what I'm talking about here. I recognized the change that was going on. I don't know, you probably saw that Ron DeSantis spent like $100 million in Iowa and didn't win the Iowa caucuses. I spent um, $23,000 on television and my campaign spent a total of less than a million dollars and I won the Iowa caucuses. How did that happen? Because I went out and talked to blue collar people all over Iowa. That's what I did and I talked about energy and manufacturing and immigration and all the things that you think that no Republican really was really talking that much about. I was talking about families. You see, one of the missing pieces of, of what we're talking about, what, one of my, I'm a big fan of what they're doing in Hungary. Am I a fan of all the specifics of what they're doing in Hungary with respect to family policy? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, you can make arguments about them, but you know what they're doing? They're talking about it. They're actually trying to do something. It's a priority. A lot of the things that there is being talked about here is not necessarily you have to pass something, but you have to talk about it. You have to jawbone it. You have to make it, talk about it enough that people actually think you're serious about doing something. So it's not, you know, I always, you always hear this about, you know, politicians get told this all the time. People don't care what you think until they, people don't, uh, yeah, what is it? People don't, uh, yeah, care what you think until they know that you care. Right? And so part of, the, part of the effort here, and that's why, again, I applaud you for this, is we have to make this more of a center of what we're talking about. I went around and I had solutions. Yeah, I had ideas. I, I had plenty of ideas of how we could help families and how we could help, uh, because the family problem is a huge reason for the decline in, the middle, uh, in middle America. What we've done to young boys, what we're doing, what we've done with, with, with uh, uh, with women in the workplace and, and, and the dynamic that's, that, that's all around. We need to begin to address those issues. And, and we have to just talk about them. And, and again, some of the solutions are not passing legislation, but just promoting certain values and ideas. And so that's what I did. And I was able to not only win Iowa, but you know, go ahead and, and win a bunch of states. And I was out spent four, five, six to one. And so I thought, well, I knew I had something here. So I wrote this book. 
and believe it or not, I got a call. I was doing a radio show in New York, and I got a call uh, that someone wanted to talk to me because they heard me on the radio talking about this book. And, I, and they asked me to come by and see him. I said, okay, fine. So I came by, and I walked in to his office, and he's sitting behind his desk in his office, and he's holding a copy of my book. And he said, I read your book. I said, yeah, yeah, you probably didn't read my book. And he said, no, no, I read your book. Great book. You know who that is? Yeah, Donald Trump. Donald Trump, in the summer of 2014, we had an hour conversation talking about my book and talking about someone needs to run, this is what he said, someone needs to run for president on this book because this is the problem in America. Working men and women are getting the short end of the stick. Now, I always maintain that Trump is like Moses. Trump was able to do something I couldn't do with the Republic. I went to RNC meetings. I went all over the place trying to plead with people to begin to address these issues, understand who our party is, understand what our future is, and start dealing with these issues. No one would pay attention. So Trump was like Moses. He got us out of bondage. He got us in, he got us out of, of the of, of the old establishment corporatist ideal that was the Republican Party that was stuck in the past and was looking to pursue voters who don't want to vote for us anymore. The problem is with Trump is that to get to the promised land, we need a Joshua, not a Moses, because Moses never got us there. Now, we may get Moses again here in the, in the next few months, but ultimately, if we're going to reach people, if we're going to reach people that we need to really build a dominant majority movement in this country, we're going to need someone who actually doesn't break a lot of glass to get their message across. And so part of that, and my closing comment is, part of this waiting for this next person, waiting for this Joshua, or Joshua's, hopefully many of them, to come along is going to take not just someone who can communicate directly with people and do it effectively, but it needs some, in, some, some intellectual support. It needs some substantive ideas. There was a lot of a description of the problem, not a lot of ideas on how to solve the problem today. But that's why I wanted to come here and just plead with you that if we are going to be a conservative movement in the future, we have to understand that we have to address this issue, these voters, because they will, they are the vast majority of America. I mean, this is so exciting because as a conservative Republican starting out in, in this, it was always a struggle to figure, how do we cobble together enough people to win elections? Here, it's how do we convince enough people who agree with us to vote for us? We got a huge majority. Now we just have to figure out how to convince them that we actually are on their side. What a wonderful opportunity you have. I mean, it's a smorgasbord out there. Please help us deliver that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, gentlemen, for four uh, just very, very uh, deep and actually uh, moving as well as fact-filled uh, presentations. I want to, we're going to have a conversation up here, and then we're going to have an opportunity for questions and discussion involving uh, the audience, including people who are watching uh, on stream. You can send in questions, and we will, uh, we will get to them in the next session. I'd like to uh, begin. Uh, by giving each of you, in order, uh, an opportunity to make any comments uh, about the other presentations or specific uh, questions. I've got a couple of questions of my, my own, but I want to uh, begin with the four of you. Oren? Sure. Well, I, I would agree with what you said. I thought it was, it was a phenomenal combination of presentations that really came at this from a lot of directions. I, I appreciated the senator's point at the end that 
most of it had been descriptive. And I think yeah. that, was a, that was appropriate given the prompt is what ails the working class right. in America. But I, I think- I'm, I'm gonna press you all on solutions. So I, I, I will unprompted jump into okay. that just a little bit to, to suggest a, a frame for it. You know, I think Ian probably pushed the furthest in that direction. Yeah. Um, we can get further into the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of some of those prescriptions. But more broadly, I think it's really important to think in terms of what we've lost. What, what was it that made the United States a place that did create extraordinary opportunity for the middle and, and a place where capitalism was delivering on its promise? And how have we gotten away from that? Because I don't think tax rates is the answer. Among other things, tax rates are much lower. <laughs> And it seems to me that, that fundamentally what we, what we had and what we have lost is a, a sense of interdepend, an interdependence that in fact the working class was necessary to the economic progress of the country, both, both in the moral sense but also just in the practical sense. If you wanted to start a business and earn a lot of money, you could be the capitalist, you could be the business owner, but those workers were actually just as indispensable. And we have shifted to an economy where that is by and large not the case, that in fact you are welcome or encouraged to go use workers somewhere else instead or complain about a labor shortage until a different worker is brought in for you uh, or as is most popular from our top business schools, simply go to Wall Street and trade the assets of existing operations around in circles. And so it seems to me that, that that fundamental question, how do we make it so that creating good opportunities for workers is the way to be successful and generate a profit in this country is the, is the foundation of our economy? Because it used to be and, and it is not right now. Thank you. Nick? I have a great beginning to our discussion. Thank you for organizing this, Chris. And um, Oren, I think that uh, starting out by asking what we have lost is absolutely the right way to start. I'd enumerate a couple of things here just for consideration. Um, I'd start with uh, what uh, Charles Mary described as uh, the bubble and the uh, enormous gap between the describers and the deciders on the one hand and more or less everybody else in the United States. One of the things that I think we've lost big time is empathy. I think there's an extraordinary empathy gap in the United States now that colors all of our discussion on the working class and the plight of ordinary Americans. Um, what have we lost? We've lost economic growth. Uh, Ian's gotten that part of the reasons for that. But if you look at uh, economic growth in the United States during the entire course of the 21st century, it's at half the per capita pace that it was during the previous uh, half century. A growth isn't the only thing in the world, and I think that Oren has argued eloquently why it isn't, but, uh, but money changes everything. And if you've got slower growth, you've got a whole lot less options. Also slower is education. The in increase in educational attainment in the United States we were the wonder of the world for a century, no longer. For some reason, our escalator has slowed big time. That changes the entire tableau of opportunity for people. Um, what, what have we gained? We've gained an extraordinary felonization in our population. We don't look at these numbers, but they kind of matter. Uh, probably something like 25 million convicted felons or ex-felons in our country probably about one in seven adult men. Does that matter? It matters enormously whether we uh, discuss it or not. Uh, we've also uh, gained uh, immense welfare dependence, and by welfare I'm talking in particular about means-tested benefits. If, uh, if you wonder what's killing the middle class, you can kill middle class mentality pretty well by seeking and by going and deciding that you need uh, means-tested benefits. Um, I'd end just with two words here because I think they matter as much as any of the policy re uh, recommendations we can come up with. Human agency. Americans are not helpless victims in the face of probability curves. Human beings can make their own futures even in the face of some unfavorable trends. 
And uh, that is also something I am afraid that we have lost, the sense of human agency in our country as much as we should have. Thank you, Nick. Ian? Yes, I, I think the senator really hit the nail on the head when he said that you know, we have the answers. We have, we, as conservatives who believe in capitalism and dynamism, we have the answers, but we just don't properly package it. If you look at what happened in, I'm, I'm going to go over this, the Atlantic again. If you look at what happened in the, uh, the, uh, the last election in the UK, Boris Johnson's Conservative Party really made huge inroads with the working class vo uh, voter in, in Britain. They won constituencies that they'd never had a chance in before. Bly Valley, a, a, another old mining place up, up, up in the northeast of England, turned conservative for the first time in over 100 years. And he did that not because he was uh, proposing a new set of, uh, of, of policies which dampened down on capitalism, but because he actually understood the question of identity. And understanding the question of identity, what, what is the working class identity in America is absolutely vital to us. And that we have to learn to start talking that language. If we don't, then we're not going to get anywhere, I think. Senator. Um, in picking up on that, there was a county in, in Pennsylvania that I never got more than 35% of the vote that now votes consistently 70% Republican. <laughs> uh, and the reason is simply this. The Democrats say that they're deplorable people. Now, I don't know how long, how long they're going to be that stupid, that they deliberately go out and demean big swaths of the American public. Um, and they rob them of the opportunity to make a living because of their energy policies and manufacturing and all these other policies that destroy decent blue collar jobs. But let's just be clear, and I, I said it here, but I want to reemphasize. A lot of these folks are with us because the other side has simply abandoned them and, and have demeaned them. Uh, we have to have something that, that is going to make them sticky and, 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 and support us as opposed to just being hating the other side. Uh, and, and to me, it, it comes down to all the economic stuff that we've talked about here is absolutely critical, absolutely important uh, for us to create more opportunity. And, uh, but I, I just I have to come back to, to, to families uh, and, and, and the fact that you know, our birth rate is 1.6 per, per family. I mean, that's, we're dying. Uh, we're dying, and, and, and that just tells you how, how hopeless people are. I mean, to me, children is a sign of hope and, and that you believe in the future. And so we have a whole bunch of people who have record levels of depression, record levels of abuse, record levels of addiction, of whether it's pornography, which is a scourge on men, and to, 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 to screens, to you name it. And, if, and, and I know it's hard to say, well, how do we legislate around those things? I, I get it. It's hard. But we, that's why I'm here. Because there are a lot of smart people here who can think about what we can do to help create more marriageable men. I wish I could, I, I wish I had a nickel for every young woman I know who's just amazing, you know, in their 20s and 30s, and they can't find a, they can't find a marriageable man. And it, it, it's just, it's pathetic. It's awful. We're, 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 we're just destroying our own culture. And, and we don't talk about it. We as conservatives don't talk about it. We don't. We don't. We don't put forth ideas. We don't. We don't jawbone about it. We just. We just sort of accepted it. Well, you know, it's sort of beyond you know the scope of government. Well, well, maybe beyond the scope of public policy, but it's not the beyond the scope of leaders of our country. And and sometimes we. One of the things the other side does much better than we do, is. They're willing to promote their ideas, even if they don't have a solution necessarily that works. It's always spend more money. But they're, they're not shy about speaking out about what they think is the right thing for, for right direction of the country when it comes to the culture. And we do. We, we, we don't run our campaigns on it. We're afraid to. You take abortion. Name me a Republican who makes abortion the central theme of their campaign. None. Zero. Zero. Name me a Democrat, 90% of them. 
Why? Because we're just cultural cowards. We just got to stop it. We lose if we don't say what we believe in. We lose if the other side carries the narrative. Just, just stop it. Just, you know, it's like giving money to Dartmouth. Stop it. Don't do that anymore. Don't do things that we know are going to come back and bite. Just stop it and start doing things that show that you care about what's going on in this country. Rick, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to ask uh, uh, these gentlemen one question, and then we'll turn to the audience. As I listen to your presentations and what you just said, <clears throat> I'm, I'm impressed that you home in on, on things that are relatively uh, beyond government policy levers. Um, and <clears throat> what I draw for this is that we should get Rick to run for president again. <laughs> that is, we have had, we've had presidents who, whether you like or dislike their policies, were able to convey a sense of agency and empathy connected with the people, with, with average people. I think Franklin D. Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan are the two most recent ones. Um, who gave people a sense of a degree of national community and caring about each other, and were highly successful as politicians, and probably a good deal of their success <clears throat> as policy leaders came from that too. So we can, we can hope for that. In the meantime, I think that everybody, uh, uh, all the four of you, probably agree um, on many issues. For example, the issues of overregulation, suppression of business formation that uh, Ian uh, emphasized. Uh, when, when Rick was talking about his campaigning in Iowa, talking about average people, they wanted to talk about energy, inflation, immigration, and families. They probably want to talk about the same things uh, today, probably on energy policy, inflation, immigration, uh, and families, there's a lot of agreement here, but there are there, but there must be some things uh, that where there's disagreement, where there are issues in coming up with a politics appealing to the working class. One thing that uh, at least uh, uh, I heard everybody mention it, but I think Nick and Ian, and especially. Uh, were the problems of welfare dependency and the expansion of uh, income support, mean-tested benefits of one kind or another. Um, I'll bet that nobody was complaining to Rick when he was campaigning for president about uh, the welfare state and wanting to cut back on benefits. And it actually seems to be something that Democrats and Republicans agree on, is that we're not going to touch, uh, touch the, uh, the welfare state. So that seems to me to be a pretty big problem facing the construction of the political coalition, coalition the senator hopes for. I, back in 1996, I was one of the authors of welfare reform and talked about it throughout my political career. And the idea that we are, we are giving any kind of welfare benefits to able-bodied single men or women is ridiculous. Is just re and, and yes, I think we can talk about that. And I think we should talk about that. Uh, I think we, we need to support families and we need to support children and we can talk about how we do that, but it's not, th th that, the question is, is how we do it, not whether we do it. But the, right. the idea that we have, as a party have accepted welfare uh, uh, to uh, single men and women, I, I, I don't accept it and I don't think it's something that we should accept. There is. The, the idea that that of, of responsibility and self-sufficiency and 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 bootstrapping and all those things and if you're a single man or a single woman you should you should be held to those uh, to, to that challenge Can I pick that? yes I mean I, right. we have the we have the perfect case study this week we, we have this this debate over the Smith Wyden tax bill probably the largest element of which is a proposed expansion of the child tax credit now the Biden administration, converted the child tax credit to an unconditional payment to everybody during the pandemic. They thought that was going to be super power popular. It was not. It fell on its face. Republicans did a, an important job standing up to that and saying, we do not just mail checks to everybody. 
comes along now, we actually have a deal. We're not gonna mail checks to everybody. What we're going to do is actually expand the child tax credit in a way that gets more benefit to working families faster. Okay, it's still connected to work, but a family can receive more benefit sooner, even in excess of the amount of taxes they've paid. It's not a means-tested welfare benefit. To the senator's point, if we want to actually be talking about things that families want, if we want to be giving them a reason to support us, here's something we could be talking about. And yet, institutions of the old right, the Heritage Foundation where we sit, the American Enterprise Institute, are out banging the drum as loudly as they can that we should not do this, calling it welfare specifically over and over again, making no distinction between means-tested welfare and support for working families, making no distinction between the single able-bodied adult and the parent who, who is in fact working and trying to support a family with kids and actually trying to shoot the bill down on this basis. It is, it is exactly ultimately the demeaning that the senator was talking about that Democrats are making huge mistake doing it, but we still have huge segments of the conservative movement doing it as well, and it, and it makes no sense and it is, it is exactly the opposite of what we are talking about here in the direction we need to go. So if we're going to come up with a um, prescription, we need to have the diagnosis. And I think that, I think our diagnosis isn't as good as it should be because we're stuck at a particular moment in time in this, I guess what we'd still call the, um, uh, post-Cold War era. Um, I did some homework at AEI uh, earlier uh, last year, and it's in this slide deck that I showed you for a series I wrote called um, who, uh, who Won the Cold War? And if you look at what's happened in the United States uh, since the wall came down, uh, the United States has uh, the least impressive improvements in wealth for its median citizens of any of our NATO allies or our East Asian allies. Um, we do not look so good compared to those East Germans if you look at the health for boys and girls who are born in 1989. There's something that's gone very seriously wrong in our country since the end of the Cold War, and I don't think that uh, I don't think that I have a good description of it yet, but it's not a bad place to start. <clears throat> Surely one of the things which has been part of the problem has been the historically unusually mediocre political leadership that we have faced under both Republican and Democrat, under both Team Blue and Team Red. And if I were to uh, point to any particular uh, epicenter of that, I think it's exactly what Rick Santorum said, it's the cowardice. It's the cowardice of political leadership uh, that we've seen over this period. Uh, I wish I had a good remedy for that, but I think maybe starting by describing it and calling it out is a place <coughs> to start. Nick, thank you very much. We're going to turn to questions from the audience. We have a roving, two roving microphones. Uh, when the microphone comes to you, if you could please uh, briefly introduce yourself and ask your question. We'll start with this gentleman here. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks so much for a great presentation. My name's Ben Rutledge. Uh, I have a question for Oren, which is how do you think we should address the scourge of in-work poverty that you articulated so well. So an issue that affects the UK as well as the US. Millions of working people, Rick's 74%, you know, the, the workers, not the owners, who can't afford to feed their children nutritious food. I think you know the issues. Um, I sense there's a reluctance on stage um, to engage in, you know, regulatory measures that provide incentives or minimum standards. How else do we incentivize profitable, successful companies into paying decent wages for ordinary workers. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I should say I have no reluctance on, on any of those matters. <laughs> um, the, I think a good place to, to start, and this is research we started doing at American Compass, is to focus less on just the number of jobs we have in this country and look at the nature of those jobs. It's, it's, it's either malpractice or a strange conspiracy, probably just malpractice, 
that we conduct these massive surveys every month of you know, 60,000 households to make sure we can get unemployment measures down to the tenth of a percent. Nick has spoken, I mean, the, the issue that we don't look at, at felony-related issues is, is another big one, but we don't ask anybody about their jobs for the most part. We just, well, look at that, now there are 134 million jobs, you know, check plus. So we can't survey 60,000 people a month, we, we surveyed 1,000 people, but we've, we've done this a couple of times now and you get similar results. We just ask them some basic questions about their job. Okay, you, you pass the test as employed, as the BLS would define it. Well, what's your salary or you know, wage annualized? Uh, do you have any sort of predictability in your schedule? Do you have foreseeability into what those earnings are going to be over the year? Do you have health benefits? And do you have paid time off? Uh, and we set the salary threshold are you making $40,000 a year? Not, not a generous thing. We say, if you have those things, we'll say you have a secure job. Most jobs in the United States are not secure jobs, about 40% overall. For people with less than a college education, it's less, it's, a, it's two thirds of jobs are not secure jobs. And so while I take Nick's point about human agency, I think it's incredibly important to emphasize that the individual person has tremendous agency. It's also important to step back and recognize that what our economy has generated is tens of 100 million jobs that do not meet the basic threshold anybody up here, I think, would say is going to be something you would aspire to as a, a solid family supporting job in this country. And, and that is not a, a regulatory problem, that is not a human agency problem, that is a, our economy is not generating the outcomes that we need it to. So what do you do about that fundamentally I think it comes down to saying that has to be the thing that is the sine qua non of being a successful business person and making a profit in this country. And so just one place, this idea that we should ever again hear the phrase labor shortage, I think is outrageous. It just is. First of all, you know how you do away with your labor shortage? You make your jobs more productive. Hey, that'll be great, instead of having decade after decade of declining productivity. And you create better jobs. That's how you be successful in America, and if we can get to that, I think, and we then talk about all the policies around enforcing that, that, that is where we need to get to. Yes, sir. We have three questions over here at the beginning here. Real quick, my name is Bob Patterson. I write for the American Conservative. It's fine. Better? Yeah, it's good. My name is Bob Patterson. I write for the American Conservative. Outstanding panelists. This is a really impressive uh, discussion. My question is the dirty word in conservative circles about how to fix this problem. I think both here at Heritage and AEI across town don't really like to talk about industrial policy. And uh, I, would, I would argue that America had an industrial policy through most of the 20th century that even Ronald Reagan embraced uh, through his uh, Star Wars project and uh, you know, focus on uh, uh, semi semiconductor production. But this American industrial policy, we might call the American way, we rejected it in the 90s for globalization and financialization. So how do we get Republicans to talk about industrial policy in a positive way? And not just, Dr. Murray, with due respect, I, I believe in deregulation, but we should never have, uh, we should have not deregulated finance or the banks, because that's been a major part of this problem. So how do we talk about industrial policy in a positive way? Um, in, are, are we going to collect questions or one at a time? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, I think we. I think that. Um, I think there are probably some differences up here. I think that I don't entirely. Agree, I know I don't entirely agree with Oren, but uh, and I don't know how that plays out with Senator Santorum and with Ian. Um, I. I would think that the aspects of what we might call an industrial policy that we're not doing that I myself think are most critical have to do with uh, science and research and R&D in the United States. Um, we, in retrospect, made a, um, I think, a, a, big, a big bipartisan mistake with uh, China and WTO. Um, 
And that was not because of the structure of the Chinese economy. That was because of the structure of the common CCP. Um, with res and also, this relates to the educational slowdown that I was talking about, because I think that more skilled and more knowledgeable workers uh, are more productive workers and can uh, afford um, afford stronger families as well, although I'm not sure that's exactly the way the causation always goes. Um, where, uh, where I leave the train is when we start talking about um, planning of the United States economy and planning of trade, because I think that tends to leave a country poorer. And um, I tend, perhaps naively, to think that a poorer country is also going to be a country that has got less options for its, uh, for its workforce. I have a chart in, uh, in that little file that I left there, which I find intriguing. Maybe nobody else does, uh, looking at the percentage of decline in manufacturing jobs over the 21st century by county. And the, um, and the labor force participation of counties in America. And the thing which is fascinating about that chart is that there's no relation, whatever. First of all, thank you for calling me Dr. Murray. I'm actually not a doctor. Uh, I, I have two masters, but they wouldn't let me trade them in for a doctorate. <laughs> um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to push back on, on the financialization, uh, the, the, the financial issue. Uh, if you look at what the, the, what the effects of regulation of, of, of banks after the Dodd-Frank uh, Act came in, uh, big banks survived. They thrived under it. Medium-sized banks had to consolidate. Smaller banks either just found they couldn't, uh, couldn't do what they used to be able to do. I, I used to work with uh, uh, the, the, the president of a tiny bank in Texas, State National Bank of Big Spring, Texas. He used to originate mortgages for a $30,000 shack down a dirt, dirt road. He couldn't do that anymore under, uh, under Dodd-Frank. And, uh, and, and if they didn't survive, they closed. So what, what we saw was uh, a, a consolidation of the banking industry as a result of financial regulation. And the people that suffered most from that were things like small, small business owners and entrepreneurs who couldn't actually, found they couldn't actually do the, the riskier lending that they used to do, which would help in the creation of, of those firms. So I think you know, when, when we're looking at uh, 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 banks in the financial uh, sector, we need to look at the effects of the regulation rather than just saying that regulation in general is, <coughs> is, uh, is a good thing. When it comes to industrial policy, I, 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 tend to, I, I recognize that virtually every country has an industrial policy, uh, uh, whether it, they call it that or not. But to me, it, it seems that the, uh, the, the lessons of public choice economics uh, can't be ignored. Uh, industrial policy tends to attract uh, rent-seeking and the sort of corporatist behavior that, uh, that, 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 that is, is, to my mind, such a problem uh, in, the, in the United States. You know, we, we want to get, uh, tr try and erect a wall of separation between government and business, uh, if we can, rather than trying to uh, to, to, to encourage a, a sort of back and forth between them that only helps the politically connected. We have two minutes left. I've called upon two people, and uh, we're going to try to uh, get their questions and comments, and then we will conclude. Yes, ma'am. Okay. My name is Yasmin Hilpert. I'm the uh, counselor for labor and social affairs at the German embassy. I just have uh, a couple of questions, but I promise I'll be quick. One is for uh, Owen. I think you posed a lot of really interesting questions with the data that you put out, um, and especially with the decline in living wages. Um, I know this data as well, and I know that it particularly um, exploded in the 80s, and some other think tanks might say that that is due to some of the Reagan-esque policies that come. So one question would be sort of how you see that and how you do how do you mitigate it now? Um, a second question is for Nick, which was about um, the issues that you raise in terms of the people who are not participating in the labor force. And um, so the question there is that politics is sort of downstream from culture. And so my question would be one, how do you help culture through politics? And two, since there are some regional variations in that as well, how effective do you think federal policy can be there and what is sort of the responsibility of the states? Thank you. And could I, 
gentleman, before you respond, could you please hand the microphone to your right, and we're gonna, I'm gonna listen to both of these last questions and then turn it over to the panelists. Thank you so much. My name is Dr. Myrtle Alexander. I have a question regarding the felonization and education in this country and the declining one and the uprise of the other. So how do we address that? And to the senator, the panel was beyond brilliant, I have to say. But when we look at, said, cultural cowards and the Republicans, you're at a critical crossroads. As one who is actually bold enough at this time in America in the 21st century to run as a conservative for the delegate to the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. That's how confident I am that the tide is turning. And black Americans, before Martin Luther King's assassination and JFK's assassination, were majority Republicans. This is what I'm hearing in Washington, D.C. today. If you don't harness that, if you don't provide for them, mm. you've lost them. How do we get there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, I'm going to run down. Some questions have been put here. And uh, it, it is 12 o'clock, but I'd like to let people uh, respond and say a few last words. Oren? Sure. Well, briefly, with respect to the sort of long-run trend in wages, I think it's exactly right that it's been a, a very long-run challenge and that, for instance, the Reagan years were not good years on that account. Um, and so I think that speaks to, you know, I, Nick and I ultimately probably agree for the most part that growth is Im important and a good thing. And the question is, what kind of growth? And I think the conservatives for a long time have simply assumed the rising tide lifts all ships. If we deliver the growth, the rest will follow. Um, and I think it's very important to recognize that that empirically is not true, and we're going to have to get a level deeper than that if we're going to deliver for people. I wish I could say more about the education felonization connection, but there is a um, there's a statistical blackout on felons in America today, which uh, is mystifying to me, and I think from a policy standpoint, completely inexcusable. I mean, we're the first new nation that began using big data. In 1790, a census was big data, like 18th century big data. Um, why we can't uh, illuminate the circumstances for 25 million uh, Americans is beyond me. Um, as, to, um, as to the question of male uh, dropouts and family and things like that. I mean, there's just a, there's a ton of social science research on that. But I think that actually uh, um, the words of the great um, social researcher Nathan Detroit probably got at it much better than anybody else. I, and Chris, you probably know this by heart. I don't quite. <laughs> uh, oh, when some lazy slob takes a good paying job and he smells, smells of, of Vitalis and Barbasol. Barbasol. Uh, call it dumb, call it clever, uh, but you can bet forever that this guy is doing it for a doll. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think you, you, you raised a very important question on, on felonization uh, on, uh, and, and, and the, the, effects, uh, the effects of the prison system in, in America. It, it, it's, it's something that uh, astonishes me that, that essentially sometime in, in, in the 1970s that the, the, the uh, people in charge of what is supposedly called corrections gave up on, correct, on correction and uh, just assumed that recidivism was, uh, was rife and, that, uh, and, and stopped at, uh, attempting to address uh, the needs of the people who were in prison precisely because they didn't have skills or, uh, or, or understanding or whatever. Uh, we really need to get to, the, the, get to the bottom of that. We really need to make corrections corrections again, rather than just a, 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 what unfortunately in so many cases is, is, is just a, a, an inhumane hellhole. It's, it's absolutely vital in my opinion. Uh, your question about uh, the black community and I, I've, it, it's uh, it's it's one of the most difficult things I've had I've tried to to, to grapple with um, as a senator. I spent I can't even tell you I spent more time in the black communities in, in Pennsylvania than I did uh, anywhere else. I I hardly ever went to the suburbs, um, and I just got crushed every time. Didn't matter. 
Um, and so there is that sense among Republican politicians that it doesn't matter, that no matter what you do, uh, you're not going to change. They're not going to change their votes because, you know, 90 plus percent of blacks vote for Democrats, and it's been pretty consistent. in, in spite of what would would appear to be reasons not to, um, for example, education, educational choice. I mean, that's just it's so obvious that that community is very much in favor of it, and the Democrats are are and, and yet they go to the polls and they vote for the other side. So there is there's that. Um, but uh, I, I think your point is that, that that community used to be heavily Republican, now it is heavily Democrat. Um, I think there, there, there is an opportunity. And, and plus, there's just, you talk about the need. I mean, this is a community that is, that is underperforming vis-a-vis -vis the rest of America. It's just true. And so I think we, we have an obligation to take the message we have and, and maybe you, you, you can talk about education, talk about the felony issue, talk about issues that more disproportionately affect that, the black community. And, uh, and I give Donald Trump credit for this. He's not afraid to talk about it. And, and again, I come back to the cowardice that is the conservative movement. No offense, but it is. Uh, we, we just are, we, we're just are, we love talking about economics. We love talking about things that are really safe to talk about. But we don't want to be scolded by the media for talking about things that are really controversial. And because you, mm -hmm. you don't want to be called a bigot, you don't want to be called a racist, you don't want to be called a homophobe, you don't want to be called a transphobe. So we don't. So we just stay away from them. And they bully us. Uh, and the reason we, I, I think the reason we haven't done as well in the black community is because sometimes we're just afraid that if we do that, we may say something that's going to get us in trouble and we'll be called a bigot or we'll be called a racist. That's just the reality. I'm just telling you, as a politician, those are the things you think about. You know, what's the, what's the cost benefit for me going there? Because the benefit doesn't look very high if 90% of folks are going to vote for them, no matter what happens. And the cost could be really high because they could come after me for saying something that maybe I shouldn't have said. Now, I know that sounds really stupid, but it isn't. It's real. And so, again, um, we just have to... We have to care enough that we don't care what the consequences are. We have to care enough about actually fixing and, and at least addressing and, 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 and working <clears throat> with, with, with people who are hurting in this country without worried about what Joe Scarborough is going to say the next day and trying to make fun of you. As someone who has been made fun of prior to Donald Trump, probably more than anybody else, uh, you know what? It isn't bad. It's not, you, you'll survive. You'll be, I'm here. It's okay. You, you'll get through this, and, and, it's, and it's worth doing. Oren, Nick, Ian, Rick, you are, among other things, great teachers. Thank you very much for being with us here at Heritage this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, the session is adjourned. Thank you.